I think that the fundamental true north of how we've organized uh, our economy is about to shift completely. <laughs> it's about to shift, and it has to shift not just because it sort of, I think, makes sense for it to shift. It has to shift because if it doesn't shift, we're out of a planet. We're done. The engine that we built to drive you know, Western and increasingly other forms of capitalism um, uh, was what I call a corn syrup fueled, fossil fuel uh, driven, uh, like muscular American V12 engine. And we built it sort of post-war to you know, around now. Um, and we built it to outcompete an enemy. And that enemy was a, a, a different approach to the world that was broadly called communism. Um, and we won. We built the most muscular, most th throughput, like highest growth, most consumption, most production. You know, we built this thing. And the boomers who are now retiring were really the ones who built it. Um, and you know, encouraged by administrations and, and basically an entire school of thought, a philosophy, which is the true north of this old way of, of looking at the world, which was sort of the Friedman Chicago School of you know, maximize shareholder value, right? And you go public and you just make those shareholders money. You extract capital from your business and put it into the pockets of your shareholders. We took our entire retirement system and turned it into that. So instead of having an understood social contract with your employer and with the government for pensions, we said, no, we're going to maximize shareholder value. And that means everyone who needs a retirement gets a 401k. And we sort of sold it as, you're now in charge of your retirement. And people bought that. I mean, I have one. You probably have one. We all have one, right? But how's it doing right now? You know? So we have to shift from that approach to capitalism which had a byproduct. We won the Cold War, awesome. We had, a, we had an existential uh, moment in the uh, early 60s. The Cuban Missile Crisis was kind of the apex of it, it's where we said, oh my god, an entire generation coming into the economic uh, scene, the boomers in their youth, were, were forged in this moment of at any moment as I'm walking down the street, the world could end. It could end. That was the zeitgeist in the early 60s. If you've seen that um, Mad Men episode mm -hmm. about it, it's like, whoa, you know? Mm -hmm. Have a few drinks and watch that again. <laughs> um, so now here we are at another moment of existential crisis, but it's a boiling frog problem. It's, it's not like the world could be wiped out tomorrow and we need seven men in a room negotiating about how to make that not happen. We have seven billion people pushing buttons all the time that's creating an increasing sense of unease in the world. And a, and a powerful force that we need to change the economic engines that are creating an, an, an output which, at the end of the day, is not sustainable. And that output is not just rising temperatures. It's rising inequality. When you have maximizing shareholder value, what happens is shareholders, particularly ones with lots of shares, get richer and richer. And those that have few shares or no shares get poorer and poorer. And the middle class starts to disappear, which is not a sustainable society. And it, I'm not just a raving lefty or lunatic. I'm hearing this from chairmen of the boards of large public companies. I'm hearing this from CMOs who are responsible for figuring out how to repurpose the, the, the identity of a company so that consumers who are millennials who are saying that their number one issue is that we will not buy from or work for a company that is not adding positive value to the society. 